Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, as the case may be. Welcome to the last session of our webinar on Rembrandt Seen Through Jewish Eyes. Rather than reeling off the contributions of the previous nine speakers, allow me to refer you to the YouTube page of the Jewish Museum and Tolerance Center, where all the talks will be available, as the first one is already in English and with uh, Russian voiceover. The preceding talks were given in English. Today's are in Russian. You have to choose between the languages. So if you go down to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a logo uh, uh, with a globe. And if you click on it, you'll be able to click either on English or Russian. And from there on, Bob's your uncle. It's only appropriate that we end the session in Russian. After all, this whole program is for an exhibition that was initiated and being executed by a Moscow museum. Speaking from the Netherlands, where I live, I must say it's been a unique and highly valued experience for me to address such a large Russian audience. The Russian language video of the opening session has already been viewed by 1,400 viewers. I greet you warmly. The first two talks will be delivered by colleagues from the Hermitage, who have been dear friends of mine for many years, and the third by a new friend, each of which I will introduce in turn. The importance of Irina Sokolova for the study and presentation of Dutch painting in the Hermitage can hardly be exaggerated. Building on the pioneer work of her predecessors, Yuri Kuznetsov and Irina Linick, she has continued to build a monumental structure of catalogs that bring the treasures of the Hermitage in the art of the Netherlands to an appreciative worldwide as well as Russian audience. In 2017, the first two volumes of her exhaustive three-volume catalog of the Dutch paintings in the museum was published, a major advance in our knowledge of the collection, which I'm sure will also be published in English. Of great significance to specialists is her years-long research into the vast donation of Dutch art to the Hermitage by the phenomenal personality Pyotr Semenov. This is precious social and economic history as well as art scholarship. It's a scholarly book that one reads for one's pleasure and it should be published in Russian as well. Notice that this publication is volume one in the Oud Holland book series. Oud Holland means, means Old Holland, is the foremost periodical on Dutch art. The series editor is Rie Eckhart, one of the most important art historians in the country who for many years was director of the Netherlands Institute for Art History in The Hague. If I may summon a personal memory of which I am proud, it was about 30 years ago that on a visit to the RKD, I looked at the visitor's book and saw that a Hermitage curator I didn't know had signed in. With no embarrassment, I sought her out and introduced myself. It was Irina. And she was rather shy. When I found out that she did not know the director, Rudy Eckhart, I took her hand and brought her straight to his office. He was as pleased as to meet her as I was. The rest is history. Today, Irina is bringing the hero of our webinar, webinar and exhibition, Rembrandt van Rijn, home to a country where he enjoys special profound meaning, Rembrandt in Russia. Irina. Thank you, Gary, for kind, warm words. I keep thinking about the beginning of my work at RKD and the beginning of my work there. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. All listeners, we will talk today about a very interesting and complex and major topic, which is called Rembrandt's paintings in Russia. So let's go. The art of Rembrandt, a Dutch painter who worked in Leiden and Amsterdam and never left the Netherlands, proved magnetically close to people 
in a wide range of countries. This feature was noted by Ernst van de Wetteren, ironically, who ironically titled one of his articles with the question, was Rembrandt a Russian? As the author writes, and it's hard to disagree, everywhere in Russia, Germany, England, or the US, Rembrandt is perceived as their own, as their artist. The list of these countries, of course, is much wider. In the artistic images created by Rembrandt, the audience unmistakably guess the emotions familiar from their own experience. They sense the link between the visible and the invisible. And that gives rise to wide ranging associations. In this regard, the history of Rembrandt's painting in Russia, which came to Russia since the 18th century and who stayed there until the early 20th century is quite telling. How were these collections perceived by their creators, the imperial family and the Russian aristocracy? What ideas were associated with the Rembrandt myth in Russia in the second half of the 19th century? What is it that compels artists, poets and philosophers to return time and again to the work of the great Dutch master. The history of Rembrandt's paintings in St. Petersburg and Moscow contains a lot of brilliant and dramatic events. As you know, one of the outcomes of the revolution in 1917 was the nationalization and later sale by the Soviet government of many of the collections of the uh, so-called old regime. As a result, Rembrandt's works from the Russian past can be found in major museums in Europe, in the United States, the Riks Museum, the Louvre, the Washington National Gallery of Art, and in other museums. Some of the paintings, which have never left their customary place, were touched by a truly tragic fate. The famous masterpiece of the master, the painting Danae, irreparably suffered from an act of vandalism in June 1985, when one of the visitors poured acid on top of the painting and stabbed the canvas twice. But even in the light of these bitter events, circumstances, the Rembrandt collection of painting in the Hermitage belongs to one of the most famous in the world. Let me remind you that the first purchase of Rembrandt's paintings for the Russian court took place 50 years after the death of the painter. In May 1716, Osip Solovyov, Tsar Peter's commercial agent, acquired the painting David and Jonathan at an auction in Amsterdam. Uh, the slide, please. He paid 80 florins for the painting. This work had an impressive provenance. Its first owner was a contemporary of Rembrandt, the famous collector Lawrence van der Hem, who belonged to the circle of the Amsterdam elite. In June 1716, the painting was sent to St. Petersburg by sea. On arrival, it was placed in the new Tsar residence, imperial residence, the tiny Montplaisir Palace in Peterhof. It was not until 1882 that it was moved to the Hermitage. What's curious is that this painting, which was referred to in the 17th century document as the story of David and Jonathan, was also referred to in the 19th century as the return of the prodigal son also as the reconciliation of David and Absalom. And according to the hypothesis of Gary Schwartz, the composition illustrates the reconciliation of David with Mephibosheth. Such a variety of readings and interpretations of the subject is characteristic of many works by the Dutch artist. Almost all of his paintings in the imperial gallery in the 18th century were known by titles different from the ones accepted in modern literature. In the 1740s, the catalog of the Kunstkammer in St. Petersburg mentioned two small paintings by a certain master called Ribrantio. In fact, those were old copies. But in the second half of the century, uh, 18th century, Petersburg was probably the richest repository of Rembrandt's works in Europe. At the end of the 1760s, they poured 
into Russia as a kind of a massive flood. And within two decades, dozens of paintings bearing the name of the Dutch painter were bought for Catherine II through a network of Russian diplomats at European courts. Now, at the very end of the 18th century, the historian Georgi attested that the, impi uh, quote here, the Imperial Gallery has 59 of the most beautiful paintings by the painter Pavel Rembrandt, no T, called Van Rin, two large paintings, one of which represents the lecherous son and the other Danai are the most important. And of course, there are no similar ones in the world. It is clear that such a vast collection included, in addition to canvases by Rembrandt, also works by his pupils, student, which at the time were attributed to the Dutch painter, to Rembrandt himself. The authorship was to be identified later in the second half of the 19th and 20th century, but such an intensive concentration of paintings bearing Rembrandt's name makes it obvious that the heritage of the Dutch painter was given particular significance in St. Petersburg. In this respect, the gallery of Catherine the Great distinguished itself from many of her contemporary royal collections in Western Europe, in which preference was traditionally given to Italian masters of the high Renaissance. By the early 19th century, Rembrandt's paintings, the only paintings by any painter, were on display in a separate room in the Hermitage. Uh, next slide, please. And that's the uh, great drawing by Julius Friedenreich, 1841. It's known as Rembrandt Hall of Paintings. It changed its place three times in the old and new Hermitage, acquiring its present location only by the early 20th century. During the reign of Catherine the Great, Rembrandt's works were also in the collections of some of her favorites. Among the gifts of the Empress to Count Gregory Orlov was, for example, uh, slide please, the so-called portrait of Titus at the balustrade. Modern attribution is different. Uh, it's attributed to Samuel van Hoek's Hoekstraten. Now we've got to show it. Yeah, let's show the image, please. Well, that's the etching. Yeah, the etching should be next to it. It is now attributed to uh, the pupil. It's called the boy leaning against the, the banister is currently located in the Cincinnati Art Museum in Ohio after the death of each of her three favorites, so, uh, Orlov, Olansky, and Potemkin. They have treated both paintings so, for the hermitage for her as uh, the works of the Dutch master were also collected by the circle of uh, the court dignitaries. By the end of the 18th century, the collections of uh, Chancellor Besbaratka, Count Stroganov, and Prince uh, Nikolai Yusupov included uh, such works as, please show us the next uh, slide, as Jeremiah. Now you're showing uh, the drawing. This is the illustration of the 18th century. And this is Jeremiah weeping, the lamenting the destruction of Jerusalem, 1630. And the next one, please. Uh, Titus in uh, monk's robes, uh, 1660. Both are currently in the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam. And also pair portraits, um, man in hat with gloves in hand. Uh, please show that. And the lady with... Uh, an ostrich feather fan. Uh, the present location is the National Gallery of Art in Washington. The rapid uh, expansion of the Imperial Gallery was facilitated by the strategy of purchasing not individual works, uh, but collections uh, en bloc, uh, as they said. Uh, starting from late uh, 1760s, uh, this is what uh, Catherine II's agents uh, would do. In a short time, the Hermitage absorbed, uh, one by one, uh, six famous European collections. Uh, let me remind you that the Empress uh, referred to her passion for buying works of art, gluttony. Among the first of these purchased works are the Gotkovsky collection in uh, Berlin, 317 paintings, uh, including such works of Rembrandt as, please show us the next slide, as the 
on the belief um, of um, Apostle Thomas 16, 34. And the next slide, please. Um, the second feast of Esther, 1663. Both of these are currently in uh, the Pushkin State Museum of Fine Arts in Moscow. By the early 1770s, uh, the Winter Palace had uh, the magnificent painting Flora. Please show us uh, that. Um, the model for which is traditionally believed to have been uh, Saskia van Ellenburg. The work is uh, dated the year of Rembrandt's and uh, Saskia's wedding, 1634. The costume al antique suggests uh, that uh, we're looking at a historical figure. Although in the 18th century catalogues, uh, this painting was referred to as a portrait of a young woman adorned with flowers. And in the 19th century, the main character was referred to as uh, the shepherdess, the Jewish bride. In the reproduction print uh, from 1787, her image is accompanied by the inscription Ophelia. The large collection of uh, Count Henrik uh, von Brühl's collection, which arrived from Saxony, added another 600 paintings to the Empress uh, collection, um, including, please show us uh, the slide, uh, the portrait of a scholar, one of the large commissioned portraits uh, executed by Rembrandt uh, soon after his move from Leiden to Amsterdam. The portrait is uh, marked with the artist early monogram, R-I-H-L, Reminis how many late it is, uh, the last letter of which indicates the name of his um, hometown of Leiden. The large format, intricate pictorial technique, uh, and uh, naturalistic effects uh, demonstrate the skill of the young painter as he seeks to win over a new clientele in Amsterdam. In this um, innovative portrait, we almost don't feel that uh, the model is posing the slightly open mouth and the slight surprise in the gaze of the person. The way one looks um, at a person who's distracted by someone's sudden appearance uh, is a momentary effect captured with great conviction. Also from this collection, the next uh, slide, please. Right. Um, the old man in red. Next slide, please. The view of uh, Rembrandt's hall, mid-19th uh, century. This is uh, the next one, please. That's the one. The old man in red. Uh, and its stylistics is marked by a desire for monumental clarity and consciousness of form. The light uh, from above on the left uh, illuminates just the half of the old man's face, uh, while the other one is submerged in shadow. This creates a, an effect of vividness. Um, the face appears alive and changeable. The figure of this gray beard old Jewish man with a high forehead and a vertical crease um, at the bridge of the nose was referred in the catalogue of the 18th century as Rembrandt's father and later was supposedly associated with the ancient Greek Stoic philosopher Zenon. The old man in red was invariably loved in Russia and was repeatedly copied by Russian painters of the 19th century, including R.S. Kiprensky. From the time of Catherine II, the copying of Rembrandt's painting had become a widespread academic practice. Copies of Rendon's originals are by Brulov, um, Trepinin, Repin, Astromova Lebedeva, they are still in the Hermitage. Simultaneously with the paintings in Brul's collection, the Hermitage Gallery in 1767 received a portrait um, of Barty Martins. Um, please show us the next one. One of the most intimate chamber portraits painted by Rembrandt with his noticeable sympathy for the model. Barty Matas and her husband, uh, Herman Doma. Herman Doma was an ebony furniture maker and a frame maker who was probably supplying frames to Rembrandt. They were well known to Rembrandt. In 1640, the artist painted pa paired portraits of this married couple, the portrait of uh, Herman Doma in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Uh, by the time this woman's portrait was purchased, uh, the paired paintings were already in different collections. The name of the woman portrayed was first established by Wilhelm Martin in 1909. Prior to that, uh, the catalogues referred to the work as the portrait of Rembrandt's mother, or even the portrait of Rembrandt's wife. 
The faintly, vaguely embarrassed smile on the woman's face that she's trying to contain, you can read it in her eyes, uh, painted with phenomenal anatomic fidelity and accuracy right to the pink tear gland capsule, which creates the illusion of a light directed sight looking at uh, the viewer, a naturalistic effect uh, arguing with nature itself. A decisive event uh, in uh, adding Rembrandt's works to the Hermitage collection and the gallery as a whole was the purchase of the collection of Louis Antoine Creuset, Baron de Thiers. This took place in 1771 through the mediation of Denis de Draw, a confidant uh, to the Empress, uh, and caused a wave of indignation in Paris. Uh, the catalogue of this collection of 415 paints included 14 works by Rembrandt, and among them such masterpieces, please show us the next slide, as Danae, the next one please, and the Holy Family with the angels, uh, both are still at the Hermitage. From the same collection came a large painting, please show us the next slide, uh, called The Old Man with the Stick. Uh, Oh, no, apologies, that's the wrong one. Please stop here for now. The Holy Family reflected Rembrandt's experiments uh, with the transmission of light and shadow and the optical refractions on the surfaces of various objects. Uh, they brilliantly reflected uh, at least three sources of light are involved in creating the luminous effect of the composition, and we can see the subtleties of the so-called uh, Camberlicht uh, room light, to which Rembrandt attracted a lot of importance. Uh, the painter's painstaking attention to detail is reflected in uh, experience uh, with uh, infrared uh, analysis of the painting. On the right-hand side, you can see a fragment so, of the angel depicted in the left uh, top-hand uh, corner of the painting. Infrared uh, rays indicate uh, that initially this angel was holding a branch of flowers in his hand, and in the final version, the artist removed this detail and added a wreath of small flowers, uh, which um, the angel holds behind his back, an allusion to future passion. Next one, please. Um, and this is what I missed. Um, again, this painting arrived uh, from Krasadier's collection. It's um, currently in the, the Lisbon Museum. Uh, and uh, the Galusta Gonka Museum, uh, the imagery of the stately old man in rich robes with uh, soft uh, feathers uh, was considered to be the portrait of Rabbi Menashe ben Israel in the 18th century. The next one, please. Um, around um, 1780, both in England and in France, uh, two famous art galleries were purchased and they were destined to become the last uh, in a chain of um, artistic victories uh, of the Empress. Uh, these were both uh, containing outstanding works of art. Uh, the English Prime Minister's correction, Robert uh, Walpole's collection, only contained one work by Rembrandt, uh, but it was a work, a masterpiece, The Sacrifice of Abraham. A large historical composition dating back to 1630. Five, uh, showing a profound artistic understanding of the Old Testament history. Even in the earlier views of the painting, critics were talking about its great emotional impact on the viewer, emphasizing the fact, and here I quote, uh, Rembrandt avoided a demonstration of horror, covering the face of Abraham with uh, his hand. Uh, the acuteness of the experience uh, corresponds to the extreme accuracy of their poses and gestures. The Patrick's face expressing shock is turned towards having a tear rolling down his cheek is cold in the strands of his beard. Uh, the steel blade with a shining golden hilt that has fallen from his hand is a striking, telling detail that reveals the meaning of the drama unfolding before our eyes. Uh, 
working on the canvas, Rembrandt adjusted the idea in search of the greatest expression. Radiographs uh, and um, IR refractography indicate that Isaac lying on the ground, you can see the black and white image here, was originally depicted with his left hand resting on his waist. Uh, later, Rembrandt changed this decision. He found a final image of Isaac with his hands tied behind his back, which uh, strongly emphasizes his sacrifice and obedience. As shown by analysis, Rembrandt uh, used a limited color palette so for the painting. The main pigments are red, red earth, cinnabar, blue, azurite, and small, to yellow and brown, lead yellow tin, and umber, black, burned bone, uh, and um, lead white. Uh, in some areas, depicting the head of the angel and Abraham's beard, you can see the energetic graphic lines applied on the undried paint layer with a sharp object, uh, possibly the brush pen, a typical technique found in many works by Rembrandt. The second purchase uh, was a painting of a French um, collector, a military an amateur engraver, Simon Raphael Baudouin, and it was added to the Hermitage collection in uh, 1780 with uh, 119 paintings, including 11 works by Rembrandt, uh, among which uh, the Apostle Peter's um, projection now in the Rex Museum in Amsterdam. And the next one, please. Uh, the portraits of poet uh, Jeremy de Becco at the Hermitage currently. The latter was added to the Imperial Gallery under the legendary title Portrait of the Protestant Theologist Jacob Arminius. So, and this was a name that the picture was mentioned in early catalogs. So, the most, um, the older uh, one-person compositions uh, were also added uh, with uh, depicting old wise people. Extraordinary spiritual significance is inherent and these characters are painted in a broad, rough manner with an element of incompleteness. These paintings were the subject of keen collector interest. Uh, connoisseurs appreciated Rembrandt's art, uh, his ability to depict uh, old figures, melancholy gazes, uh, wrinkled skin and gray hair. In France and later in Russia, the painting The Old Woman in the Chair was long referred to as Rembrandt's mother's portrait and the old man, uh, old Jewish man in the chair for which the, an Ashkenazi Jew must have posed because his costume suggests that it was thought to be the image of the Englishman Thomas Parr, whose age exceeded 152 according to the legend. Late prefixes on the sides of these canvases indicate that both paintings were artfully transformed into paired compositions in the mid 18th century. Of the 11 Rembrandt works from the Baudouin collection, eight were described as pair portraits in the catalog. The change in format was often used in the restoration practice of those days. The most famous restorator was Madame Gautreau. So she was expert in Agrandi de Tableau. The title of another famous painting, the Polish nobleman, also changed several times. Now it's the International Gallery of Art in, in DC. It was brought to the Hermitage in 1768. The unusual appearance of the model provoked various interpretations. The depicted was referred to as a Turk, and then later, again, unreasonably, the Polish king, um, <clears throat> Jan III Sobieski, the fantastical theatrical costumes with elements of 16th century fashion struck the imagination of the Russian spectator. As late as in 1841, the uh, Monument des Arts Journal continued to criticize Rembrandt's improper taste, quote, his turban, sleeves, shoes, huge rubies, gold and silver jewelry make one laugh. To sum up, 
the artistic acquisitions made in the 18th century, it would be no exaggeration to say that a special place among all reverence works in Russia belonged to the painting titled The Return of the Prodigal Son. So the Empress proudly characterized it in a letter to Voltaire, my prodigal son. In 1765, when this painting was still in Paris, the Marchand François Jolin changed the rounded top of the canvas, giving it a rectangular shape. So the painting underwent this kind of restoration at the request of its previous owner, the Duke Don Cezun. Late additions with coarse craculor different from the author's layer of paint are clearly visible in the upper part of the painting. The Hermitage continued to acquire Rembrandt's paintings in the 19th century. The last such acquisition dates back to 1850, but their scale has no comparison with that of the preceding century. The importance of this period is important in another respect. The Hermitage was gradually being transformed from a palace gallery into a public museum and the collection of Reverend paintings had an increasing influence on the enlightened Russian society. In the imperial family, Reverend's paintings also enjoyed great attention. This is evidenced by some small but vivid testimonies. When in February, 1822, in the Winter Palace, an evening of Tableau Vivan was held on the occasion of the uh, uh, namesake day of the Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna. No less than four works by Rembrandt, Rembrandt were on show. Among them, The Education of the Virgin Mary. That was the title for the prophetess Anna and Child, which is now attributed to Rembrandt's pupil, Willem Drost. These paintings by Rembrandt were reproduced in a special album of lithographs dedicated to the commemorative evening, Pluchar edition. This same composition, The Education of the Virgin Mary, was copied by the Grand Duchess Anna Pavlovna as she was preparing to leave for the Netherlands after her marriage to Crown Prince Willem of Orange, the future King Willem II. This large, almost the size of the original, that copy was in the halls of the Pavlovsk palace, palace and it was lost during the World War II. Around 1830, not only Rembrandt's works, but also the image of the Dutch painter perceived through myth of the artist as a strange genius with democratic tastes who went bankrupt and who died in poverty, it firmly enters the fabric of Russian culture. The uh, manner Alalam Rembrandt is becoming widespread in the graphic arts. The heroes of the Dutch painters' paintings appear on the pages of Alexander Pushkin's classic works, such as A House at Kolomna and Journey to Ars Room, and uh, Mikhail Lermontov's famous a painting by Rembrandt, 1830, and uh, Princess Ligovskaya. The Rembrandt originals inspire masters of the academic school for their own inventions. The court painter, Eugraf Reitern, painted in 1849 a canvas entitled Abraham sacrificing Isaac, please show that, yes. Clearly, it's a reference to a Rembrandt's original. That is a new painting which is enhanced by elegance and pleasantness, qualities which, according to the Academy, were neglected by the Dutch painter. Rembrandt paintings in Russia are discussed, studied, copied, collected, and reproduced in print. In 1857, a book by the historian Alexander Andreev titled Painting and the Painters of the Major European Schools was published, the first work in Russian, from which the Russian reader was able to gather information about the life and works of Rembrandt. The popularity of the artist's name is testified by the two etching suits by the engraver Nikolai Mosolov, published in 1872. It's curious to know that one of them, entitled Paintings of Rembrandt in the Imperial Hermitage, included 40 prints, 
whereas the second, entitled Masterpieces of the Imperial Hermitage, contained only 20 uh, prints. Until the 1890s, the collection of the engraver Moslov in Moscow held a, fail, a family heirloom, please show it, a painting of an old woman trimming her nails, attributed to Rembrandt. Later, it was sold by its owner, it was sold abroad, and it was acquired by the famous American collector Benjamin Altman, who gave it to uh, the Metropolitan Museum in New York, where it is now a permanent display. Another famous painting in Moscow was thought to be the architect exhibited in the gallery of the Galitsyn Hospital until 1870. Only very recently has it been possible to identify this enigmatic Rembrandt painting. Could you please show it? So Rembrandt's pupil, Samuel van Ho Hoogstraten, portrayed himself drawing the Tower of the Western Kirk Church in Amsterdam. In the mid-19th century, Rembrandt's art was reappraised by the public. Although the Dutch painter's paintings were always admired, classic theorists, classicist theorists, criticized their wrong taste. It showed inconsistency with the Grand Gou, unattractive female models. In the early 1800s, Rembrandt's Danai was removed from the Hermitage Gallery because of the obscene subject matter. When the writer Ivan Turgenev saw this painting returned from the storage room, he wrote in a letter to Pauline Virdov, quoting, Rembrandt Danai, for all its shocking manner, made a very strong impression on me. Rembrandt is damn strong, colorful, vivid. And how stereotypical Brulov, the last day of Pompey, is. Well, we have to understand that Brulov's painting was the icon of Russian fine arts. And here comes the statement by Turgenev. So in the 1870s, in the atmosphere of the search for national identity and the modern aesthetic language, the theme of Slavic identity and borrowings from European culture was widely discussed. There was the itinerant movement and the critic Stasov, who called Rembrandt the great founder of new European art, viewed his work as an important argument in support of the idea of national Russian art. The hope of finding a Russian Rembrandt, as is well known, was embodied in Russian art by Ilya Repin. By the end of the 19th century, there were 15 paintings by Rembrandt in private collections in Russia. Most of them belonged to the Russian aristocracy, but some were owned by members of the so-called third estate, wealthy merchants and business people. So this painting, Tobit and Anna with the goat, uh, dated 1626, now it's in Amsterdam in Rijks Museum. It belonged to Dmitry Ivanovich Shukin. Before the revolution of 1905, the exodus of these works from Russia began. In a climate of political instability, owners preferred to part with their treasures. In 1910, Count Vasily Davidov sold the painting Thomas Agnew and Sons in London, the painting The Apostle Bartholomew which had belonged to their family for more than 100 years. At the beginning of the 20th century, the painting was in the family estate in Crimea. No one lived there in winter, so it was hardly guarded. The current location is Timken Art Museum, San Diego, California. Curiously enough, this painting brought to St. Petersburg in the... 1790s by Count de Laval, who had fled the horrors of the French Revolution, left Russia on the eve of Russia's October Revolution. The 20th century brought social upheavals to Russia caused by the collapse of the old world, brought by the First World War, the Revolution, the Civil War, and this 
whole turmoil. There was a sharp break in the continuity of the humanistic tradition in which the previous generations were brought up. So tellingly, in this environment, this semi-mythical figure of Rembrandt, the outsider artist, an outcast, begins to be perceived as a suffering moral ideal, moral norm. In 1980, 1920, in post-revolutionary Moscow, Hungary, Moscow, the artist Leonid Parstanak wrote the book Rembrandt and the Jews, which was printed in 1923 in Berlin and printed in, as, in, in a thousand numbered copies. The theme of the book was analysis of the paintings in which, according to its author, the wonderful features of the heart of the Jewish people are conveyed with such love and such depth. Pasternak, an excellent graphic artist, accompanied the edition with a portrait of Rembrandt he had created himself. Pasternak's book, Pasternak's book was the brightest, but not the first reference to the subject in Russia. It was covered with great sympathy in Stas of extensive article, The Jewish Tribe in the Creations of European Art, published back in 1873. Now, speaking of the 20th century, let's mention only the most famous cases referring to the name of the genius painter. Rembrandt is the most important interlocutor of the poet Osip Mandelstam in the tragic 1930s. The poet feels an inner kinship with him. In his poem, As a Martyr of Light, Rembrandt, the poet calls the artist a magnificent brother. According to the poet's widow, Nadezhda Mandelstam, the famous metaphor of the poem Kanzona, the metaphor Crimson Caress, reflect her impression of the Hermitage painting, The Return of the Prodigal Son. Modern literary scholars dispute the validity of this parallel, but this was the opinion of the poet's closest person. One of the most sub subtle observations about Rembrandt's painterly technique comes from the Moscow's painter, Robert Falk. That's his self-portrait. So speaking of Rembrandt, he wrote, there is no light and shade in Rembrandt, no chiaroscuro, he has light color. In 1936, the first monographic exhibition of Rembrandt's works was held in Moscow and Leningrad. It was a huge success, although it did not uh, have uh, 19 uh, paintings that were already sold abroad. Inspired by this exhibition, the poet uh, Dmitry Kendring uh, conceptualized a uh, drumming verse in entitled Rembrandt, which was published in uh, 1940. The image of the artist is uh, given the biographical features of the author himself. Uh, during these years, a wonderful poetic play about Rembrandt, Homer's Head by Alexander Kochetkov uh, is uh, published. The plot uh, talks about uh, a world of poetic fantasy in which the creator retreats uh, from the reality surrounding him. Our contemporaries uh, also continue to turn to Rembrandt's works. Uh, Alexander Kushner's poem, Uriah, is inspired uh, by the fall of Haman, uh, an example of the unmistakable transfer of Rembrandt's paintings hero and an erroneous interpretation of its subject. Uh, a recent essay by the poet and philosopher Olga Sedekova, A Journey with Closed Eyes, uh, Letters on Rembrandt, uh, caused um, a lot of response uh, from the readers. Uh, however, I would like to give an example in which the reference to the Dutch painter's painting goes beyond a literary fact. Um, please, um, next slide. Um, this is confirmed in the memoirs of the historian Nikolai Ansiferov. A cultural historian, author of the famous book, The Soul of St. Petersburg, was arrested in early 1930s and spent five years in the Solovetsky camps. Years later, he was allowed to return to Leningrad. This is how he describes his return to his native city. And this is um, actual ego text. We arrived uh, so early that the street cars weren't running yet. Uh, with sacks on our shoulders, uh, we went to the Grafs, uh, the family of the university professor, 
Antiferov's mentor. Ivan Mikhailovich opened the door and embraced me. And then I remembered Rembrandt's prodigal son. Here I was, exhausted uh, from a long, nearly five-year journey, kneeling before him, and he lovingly laid his hands on me. In this documentary testimony, Rembrandt's painting is elevated to a symbol of mercy on a supranational, universal scale. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, what a wonderful talk, Irina. Thank you so much for that very, very moving ending. And just to think you're all in charge of... As they say... Hmm? Yeah, of such a, such a rich and vast collection. Just think of uh, all the losses that you have, all of those paintings in San Diego and Washington and Amsterdam. Uh, if they were still there, all of us would have to live in St. Petersburg. Well, our next speaker, Roman Grigoriev, has the heavy responsibility to serve as head of the print section of the Hermitage, of the uh, Department of Western Visual Art of the Hermitage. We Rembrandt scholars have the good fortune that of all the thousands of masters in his care, it is Rembrandt that he has chosen for special treatment. Of course, that is not altogether coincidental, just as the Department of Paintings owns an eternal debt of gratitude to Pyotr Semyonov, so it is the print section's everlasting obligation to Dmitry Rovinsky. He was another of the extraordinary individuals who became selfless benefactors of the Hermitage. He bequeathed to it in his will a vast collection of about 100,000 prints, foremost among them a nearly complete set of Rembrandt's etchings. Gary, Roman has done Rovinsky Rembrandt's justice in this magnum opus, treating each of the impressions as the unique object that it is. I cannot introduce Roman without also striking a personal note, telling how dear he and his family have been to me and my wife, Luki, for a quarter of a century. I also must think of the colleague who introduced us to each other, Jan von der Waals, one of the most original and daring art historians of our generation, who was taken from us far too soon. Roman has agreed to delve into Rembrandt's oeuvre as an etcher, where so much of the association of Rembrandt with Jews found its origin. Roman. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen uh, so that uh, I'm not the only one seeing it, uh, but others see it as well. Are you seeing um, a screen share? Marina, at this point, we're not seeing a slideshow. We're just seeing the preview. What about now? Well, now you need to reshare your screen and um, try to make it full screen. Okay, well, now it's good. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to first express my gratitude uh, to the organizers of this conference, uh, to Leah Chechik, um, to Gary Schwartz, uh, to Marianne Notter. I would like to thank you all for this opportunity to make my presentation tonight. Um, and I would like to welcome all of the participants uh, joining us. Um, it's um, a rare occasion when making a presentation to a big public, I have to say both a good morning, good afternoon, and good evening all at the same time. But that's the new reality that we all have to live in. 
Today, I'm going to talk about uh, how Rembrandt's uh, printed um, work reflected uh, his um, relations of, with uh, Jews or with the uh, real Jews, with the uh, Sephardites, with Ashkenazi that uh, lived in the same city uh, with him uh, in Amsterdam and uh, with uh, cultural literature, Jewish characters that he would use in his art. Depictions of uh, Jewish uh, um, characters uh, from the Old uh, Testament in Rembrandt's work, in all of his work, and his paintings, and his prints, and his drawings are uh, constantly um, swap places uh, with his contemporary. It's a single artistic world, essentially, where no one's heard uh, about uh, an archaeologically accurate reproduction of costumes of a particular historical era or the characters move free, freely from 17th century Holland uh, to 1st century Palestine. And sometimes, as I will try to show later, they even travel back. We all know that uh, the artist uh, can freely place a Dutch young man of the 17th century with his own features, facial features, to the Jerusalem square of the first century where the Christ appears before the lattice uh, and uh, apparently none of uh, the audience were bothered by this uh, just as no one was bothered by the fact that a Roman horseman uh, a procurator of um, the Roman Judea Pontius Pilatus in Rembrandt's world grows a beard wears an eastern turban wears luxurious embroidered oriental robes uh, that uh, today most uh, resemble a bathrobe. Nobody was um, put off by the fact that uh, Roman legionnaires uh, were dressed as Western European warriors of the 15th and the 16th century, both in the early and the late uh, Rembrandt's period. Uh, so what we see is uh, turning to the Testament, turning to the scriptures uh, by Rembrandt, uh, when he turns to historical figures, uh, is done very selectively. As indicated by numerous works uh, by our predecessors uh, and colleagues, uh, Rex Forsell, Christian Tumpel, Thomas Campbell, Ben Bros, uh, the Rotterdam researcher Peter van der Kuhlen. Uh, What's important for Rembrandt was not the text uh, of the Old Testament, uh, the text of the Bible, but uh, it was uh, the pre preceding pictorial tradition. Uh, my presentation goes against uh, the overall nature of the webinar, because I'm not going to be talking about uh, the Jewish view on Rembrandt. Uh, and this is the title of our future exhibition. I'm going to talk about the way Rembrandt uh, perceived Jews uh, and how we now perceive, uh, how the great artists perceived Jews of the time. When we turn to print, um, depicting Jews, it's all very complicated. Uh, the portrait of Ben, Asif, uh, ben Israel um, has been... Um, it seems suspicious somewhat uh, from the point of view of our contemporary colleagues. Uh, the great Jewish wife of Bride, one of the most uh, famous prints uh, by Rembrandt. There's a lot of complications there as well, because uh, in line with um, a tradition that has to do with um, Rembrandt plots, we see a whole set, uh, a whole spectrum of uh, mutually excluding opinions. Uh, we still don't know what's depicted on uh, his um, prints are called uh, Synagogue. A wonderful author, Gersen, uh, the author of the first uh, catalogue of prints uh, by Rembrandt in the world, the first uh, uh, resonant catalogue uh, uh, called uh, this print uh, a Synagogue de Juif. Uh, as if it could be something other than the Juif. We see a lot of issues uh, from uh, defining the plot and the title of the a print uh, to what uh, the various elements of 
what role they play. One of the key questions that I'm going to try to dwell on today is uh, how different elements uh, of Rembrandt's works uh, seem to not uh, cohabit, coexist uh, to us today, a lot of Rembrandt's works um, are made up of um, elements that seem to contradict each other, that do not really align. And one of the key problems that we're faced with uh, when we try to attribute the plot uh, of uh, Rembrandt's prints uh, or when we try to figure out uh, what the Jewish characters are, is that's it's a problem of exotic historical costumes. So thank you to our uh, Dutch colleagues um, that um, have been doing so much recently to study the topic uh, and to help us uh, figure out um, what it all boils down to. Please have a look at these two works. Um, this is the end of uh, 1620s, uh, circa 1620, a very early Rembrandt. Uh, these two images, how different are they? It's uh, the same technique uh, around the same time, but nonetheless, we'll look at these uh, as uh, very different in terms of the genre. What we see on the left, uh, we currently refer to as uh, a beggar in a high cap, uh, standing and leaning on a stick. Uh, and what we see on the right-hand side uh, and what ignites our interest mostly, it's uh, this whole cold uh, blindness of Tobit. Uh, there is a lot of genre opposition. There is a lot of historical opposition. By the way, in the 18th century, nobody thought that the right-hand side print uh, that uh, you can see has anything to do with the Old Testament. Uh, this was only determined uh, much later. Men uh, in such a uh, costume and such a uh, hat. So there's a lot of them um, in the 1920s and 30s by Rembrandt. Um, a beggar with a crippled hand leaning on a stick. Uh, again, same technique. Uh, we see that Rembrandt's work of the 1620s and 1630s, we can't divide these male costumes and the headgear. We can't separate heroes shift from gospel to a street in the city of Leiden. So the beggar is dressed as we, the beggar who we believe Rembrandt saw in Harlem, Amsterdam, or Leiden. So the people shown on the second print on the right, Christ's disciples, this is the minor and mouse, two men. The second fragment on the right, this is um, the uh, taking from the cross print. We see that the patterns in clothing shift from one environment to the other. And the issue of the semantic of costume is really complex. And it's very hard to find answers. Yes, take a look at these images. If we didn't know that the second image on the right, the second on the left, we know that this is uh, Exodus to Egypt. We wouldn't have thought that this is not a beggar in Leiden, but this is Saint Joseph on his way um, to Egypt. So the use of reverence and the uh, observation over the uh, appearance of Ashkenazi Jews to create biblical atmosphere, I don't think this is plausible. We see the costume and we see the high hat for men 
they were used very often judging by visual evidence they were used by the dutch beggars and uh, musician beggars so ashkenazi costume as the basis for historic atmosphere and historic uh, <clears throat> flavor so to speak of the biblical scenes i believe i that is not quite correct an important thing is a turban as a marker of uh, oriental features of paganism of jewishness and non-christianity so turban is the marker of all that in Reverend's art and his circles art i'd say his contemporaries you won't see a christian wearing a turban the artistic etiquette of holland of that period would ban that so a person wearing the beret rembrandt's beret would have been worn by anyone rembrandt puts this kind of uh, beret on pontius pilate and arctic xerxes the king a similar headgear is worn by Aman as a portrait by Jan Victor's similar headgear is worn by the artist himself and by his contemporaries. This is a universal costume element which we can't attribute and define in a very strict way. So, examples, turbans on Rembrandt's prints of the 1630s. These are characters from Old Testament and New Testament. The first on the left, the first, the, the one on the right, that is from Joseph explaining his dreams. This here down below, that is a fragment from a major dry point print titled Maria's Death. We see that both old images and Old Testament images and New Testament images, the characters wear same types of clothing. That is a very interesting thing. Right. Now, here is a work from 1632, and this is the decade we're mostly interested in today, the rat catcher. What's interesting in this etching, not much attention has been paid to the costume of the person who we see in this traditional, in, in, in the uh, uh, doorway of a traditional Dutch house. We see the traditional door. The uh, left one can be opened outside and the right one separates you from the street. So the turbaned person, this is 1632, and the turban it is is not is by no means dutch and the uh, garment is no is by no means dutch but but the beggar the peddler of uh, rat poison is clothed as someone from holland he is clad in a typically Dutch set of clothes. Take a look at the way their hands interact. Okay, this face, this person is not really looking at the person he's talking to. Look at their hands. Rembrandt does have emphasis on hands the dialogue of bodily features is an important aspect for rembrandt for instance 
we see that here Pontius Pilate from uh, Ecke Homo in 1636, see, take a look at his hand, same kind of interaction, the interaction with this uh, Jewish priest or whoever that is, Pilate's hand, which is separated from the Jew's hand. The Jew is demanding the death of Christ. Christ. And we see this allegory of shepherd's uh, um, stuff, staff. Another situation where we see this fluidity people are dressed in accordance with um, biblical art etiquette, but they are placed against a Dutch backdrop. This might be a Dutch village or outskirts of a town. Jacob and Levin is a traditional title, no longer considered possible. It's obvious that they have nothing to do with the story of... Uh, so the father in law and the son in law, no, that's not their story. We don't see anyone demanding for a wife, but it doesn't get us closer to understand what this is, what story is behind this situation. I don't have a clue. I don't have a solution. I'd like to draw your attention to the correlation of the title and the image. Three oriental figures wear us. It is perfectly clear that this there, 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 are, there are four persons. Exotic attracts people much more than what we have clothes at hand. Right, this is what we know as the Jewish bride. And this is the image which we still have no agreement about, as uh, is typical of um, Rembrandt's etch etchings. We have a very vague sea of opinions. We don't have any text, and it results in the fact that we have no clear idea what we see in this etching. The earliest source mentioning this etching is the handwritten catalog by Valerius Rover, the famous Delft uh, collector. So there are two impressions, and one is uh, the Jewish bride completed, and the other half finished. So in the 1740s, there is a variant opinion. So in the stock list of etchings, probably created by Peter Schenk, the great German publisher and uh, the famous Dutch publisher, it is mentioned together with the portrait of a Bonus, who was a Jewish doctor. So even in text, they are placed side by side. And there, this etching is titled The Bride of Dr. Boyanov. And that's in about 100 years after the etching was um, created. And since 1775, after the auction sale, and that was the most famous auction sale in the history of Rembrandt's etching. That was a sale of the of a private collection. The uh, auction took place in, in The Hague, and the owner of the collection was called De Bergy. Since that moment, we see the beginning of the Jewish bride title story. Some people suggested even the most exotic and fantastical interpretations. I like the interpretation by Valentin in 1925, who says that is an actress playing the part of uh, uh, Minerva, 
So there are two competing opinions, the most common ones now. Modern Cars 1966 interpretation, who claims that this is Esther before visiting Arta Xerx. It's not quite clear why Esther is seated in a room filled by uh, these books. And what does this scroll mean, which she is holding in her hand in such a defensive fashion? Because this is the basis of the opposite interpretation uh, denied by Madeleine Carr. Another interpretation is that this is a genre scene. This is actually a Jewish bride who was met by Rembrandt in Amsterdam. She, he, she was liked by Rembrandt to such an extent that he decided to create this etching. Again, we are saying thanks to the author because he drove away printed wood from his works. So, due to the fact that Rembrandt, for unknown reasons, uh, tolerated no text in his paintings, we still have to choose between several interpretations, one of which is Versavia upon receiving a letter from David. Another interpretation. Sometimes it is really worth it to mention that it's not just a set of images, this is art. The great Jewish bride is one of the most unique prints by Rembrandt in terms of how texture is shown. So etchings, dry point technique is done in a fabulous way. So on a copper plate, Rembrandt creates the shape of not just the face, but also everything else too. And um, here we see that for Versavia, for Esther, for Jewish bride, there is an important detail, and we keep talking about the importance of this detail. When we talk about um, out of the 17th century, we see an interior of a scientist, a thinker, a philosopher, because this huge globe that's barely visible in the background combined with uh, these very thick books uh, in the background, uh, they add more mystery to the painting. We could also talk about uh, something that's uh, accepted by everyone um, across the board um, today. The first and the favorite wife of Rembrandt was um, obviously served as a model for this print. Um, and here we see Saskia with the pearls in her hair around the same time. These are mid 1630s. And uh, a wonderful uh, print, um, St. Catherine. Um, it's not so rare in uh, Rembrandt's work, so where a hundred years uh, after the creation, even uh, admirers of art, uh, even highly educated uh, experts in, in Paris in the 18th century, Gersan uh, and his colleagues, uh, they knew just as much as we do about Rembrandt's prints, uh, but nonetheless, in Catholic France, uh, a print um, depicting a young, beautiful lady and um, 
a fragment of a torture wheel that would call her the little Jewish bride. For some reason, this uh, theme of the Jewish bride uh, is um, particularly attractive for, for admirers of art. And we just heard from Irina that uh, Flora in the 19th century catalogues was called uh, a young Jewish bride, uh, etc. But nonetheless, uh, these are the misinterpretations. Uh, and now going on to the most uh, problematic uh, of the Jews uh, depicted by Rembrandt in his prints. Um, and here I have to admit uh, that I don't share the criticism, even though that uh, my spiritual mentor in Rembrandt's uh, studies, uh, Gary Schwartz, is against uh, the fact uh, that this portrait uh, from 1636 that we see on the right hand side uh, is a depiction of Manasseh Ben Israel. I will dare to voice my opinion on this. I think that the two portraits that you see in front of you are so similar that denying the oral tradition uh, recorded by Gersen in the um, mid uh, 18th century is not very reasonable, the arguments against. Uh, let's talk about those. Uh, before 1992, nobody doubted the fact that this wonderful portrait uh, is, in fact, depicting Manasseh. That we've talked about uh, so much uh, today and um, in other webinars, uh, and um, including by the author of a recently published book. Uh, but uh, there is um, no attribute here uh, Gary Schwartz um, bases his negative opinion on this, and it's not just Gary. He's joined by a lot of uh, Dutch uh, art critics. Uh, he's saying that uh, people that had to do with printing, with book uh, making, and text uh, had to have been uh, depicted uh, in line with uh, the etiquette of Holland uh, of. Um, the era had to be depicted together with a book or a manuscript, etc., etc. That's perhaps the case, but if we look closely enough, um, we will find a lot of portraits uh, of um, Dutch um, intellectuals. Um, perhaps, um, for instance, um, the portrait of uh, Jacob Matam that has no attributes of uh, book printing. And Van der Velle Jr. depicted him perfectly here. And it's not so much the question of the number of attributes depicted. The question is, mid-1630s uh, in printing, was there an accomplished tradition for depicting rabbis? When the arguments on this um, portrait uh, came around about two weeks ago, I think, uh, uh, I remember Michael Zell said something that I'm willing to commit to. I'm all for, it could have been an informal portrait. Uh, when uh, Gary Schwartz talks about the fact uh, that uh, an attribute has to be depicted, it's an absolute must. Uh, we are talking about a slightly different genre. The portrait uh, that today uh, is... Uh, now seen as a non Manasseh Ben Israel portrait, could have been an informal portrait. And the stats of um, the copies indicates that. So the portrait that we usually compare it against uh, these two portraits, uh, Silvius um, and Attenberger, it's, uh, there is a lot more copies of them have reached us. Uh, Manasseh's portrait, uh, to this day, we only have 23. 23 in total. The right-hand side, Ettenberg one, we have almost 60. Silvius, 
And uh, Silvio is approximately 40, but when I talked about these stats, I'm not taking into account uh, uh, the copies uh, that are currently considered uh, to be postmortem. I think the nose uh, and the eyes and the beard and the form of the moustache and the form of the face, to me, I think uh, deserve uh, bringing the most uh, well-known politically, um, I mean, a Jew, his remembered portrait. Uh, but we all know that um, very often it's very risque to draw conclusions of this kind based on physiognomic features. So have a look uh, at this uh, uh, image, uh, a very anti-Semitic uh, Huge uh, nose, uh, sad eyes. But who is this? Uh, it's a portrait uh, of a poet, Jan de Vos. Have a look at this uh, portrait. Uh, who is this? Um, it's the most influential person of the Dutch culture, the secretary of the Houter, Constantine Huygens. Have a look at... Um, this man, his huge nose, uh, his wonderful hair, his, uh, his hat, uh, but he has nothing to do with the Jews because it's Andreas de Graaf, one of uh, the strongest, the most uh, influential Bergen ministers uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, so the situation is uh, far from being resolved. Uh, and uh, we understand uh, that uh, there's a lot of uncertainty here still. The same sculpt head was also worn by dukes. Uh, and uh, you can see Wittelsberg, uh, the duke depicted here. These are the costumes that were worn by Jews uh, as uh, we recently were shown uh, at one of the presentations. Uh, Join towards the end of my presentation. The situation with one of the most famous prints um, by Rembrandt. Uh, in one of the earliest uh, sources, it was referred to as um, from receiving the three travels, uh, and uh, we know what this is. So our Dutch colleagues uh, discovered uh, that uh, Rembrandt uh, could not have uh, depicted uh, anything of the case. This is an invented interior. He couldn't have seen anything of the kind, uh, and it has nothing to do with um, the Amsterdam synagogue. Um, Ferris says in the temple, as Rosier indicated in his catalog, it was called the uh, Synagogue de Juif. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's uh, a historic uh, painting, a historic work uh, with one single aspect. Uh, a it's a historical work. Uh, it's a historical depiction in which Rembrandt uh, represented the way he saw it, uh, ancient Jews. Uh, in uh, this uh, wonderful fashion. Uh, this is uh, the only depiction of the real synagogue, uh, the actual synagogue, uh, dating back to from the beginning of time. This is Aldorfer's um, a print. Um, he depicted the synagogue uh, that uh, should have been destroyed uh, a few days before the destruction of the Regensburg synagogue. We have no other depictions of the kind of this is uh, the only Jew depicted by Rembrandt the Prince that has never been contested. Nobody ever doubted that this person with such expressive eyes uh, is, uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Bueno, Referee Bueno, Dr. Bonus, uh, an important uh, man for the cultural landscape of Jews um, in the 17th century in Amsterdam who commissioned portraits uh, from Lembrandt uh, and Livins. Uh, and it seems like uh, it's the last print uh, that uh, Livins produced in his life. Um, 
And the last uh, case that I wanted to discuss with you today, this very strange painting, it's a strange print um, that you can see on the left-hand side. Uh, is the, on the right-hand side of the board, on the left-hand side is the print, another example of um, what seems very logical to us today, uh, of Rembrandt's artistic uh, vision, uh, combining very different elements, very different details uh, that uh, seem to not match too much to us. Uh, I'm talking about how strangely here the three travelers, the three guests of Avraham are depicted uh, thanks to our predecessors. We know that the man in the middle is um, an allusion uh, to the Staten Bible. But um, Emmanuel Benter so focused on the angel on the right more, this very unusual exterior <laughs> depiction of the three angels, of the three holy guests of Avram that are depicted here, very different uh, from any contemporary depictions uh, where they're always young and beautiful and wonderful. Even um, Gabriel van der Hammond and Willem Harp. Uh, this is the face that was interpreted uh, as uh, an older, an aged uh, Manasseh ben Israel. This is a very contestable interpretation. To me, I don't uh, really buy into it, uh, but the fact that, again, uh, here we see a mosaic, a logic that we haven't yet grasped, uh, it's, ob it's obvious to me. And the last uh, point of the vessel that Abraham is holding, listening to the words of God, uh, was always surprising to me. I was interested in how a viewer of the 17th century in uh, Holland uh, would uh, perceive uh, an object that was part of their daily life uh, as an attribute uh, of a biblical depiction. Um, Abraham's left hand, uh, hand rests on something that's existed uh, in um, the chart starting from Van Eyck. Um, in the 16th century, you see this uh, vi wine vessel that is noticed and seen across uh, the board, across all of the uh, Dutch genre paintings uh, from Van Eyck uh, down uh, to uh, Frans Mersen Senior. To me, it's a mystery, but perhaps one day we're going to be able to grasp this logic uh, that all of these uh, strange elements are uh, seemed uh, to be guided by and how they coexist in harmony. And I guess we need to continue to study Rembrandt uh, to crack this mystery. Sorry, I'm a bit over time. Thank you so much for your attention. Gary, switch on the microphone. Gary, yeah, please you. switch on yeah. the microphone. Now, Roman, I'm going to contain myself. We're going to go into discussion with each other after Nina's talk, but you've given us a lot, an immense lot to debate and to, to think about. Well, our final speaker of the 12, Professor Nina Getashvili, is head of the art history department of the Russian Academy of painting, sculpture, and architecture after Ilya Glazunov. She is also co-president of the Russian branch of ICA and a board member of the Russian Association of Art Historians. She's the author of many publications on the art of the 20th century and popular books, including Dutch painting of the 17th century. The subject about which Nina is talking could not be more fitting as the climax of the webinar if there are pairs of Jewish eyes through which Rembrandt was gazed at with special interest and high regard, they belong to Russian Jewish artists. We will now enter into their world. Nina.
Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you very well. So by the goodwill of the organizers of our webinar, begin with a presentation by Simon Shama on the presence of reverend in the work of the 20th century artist. It was con continued in the last webinar and in Irina Alexeyevna's report and so over to my report with some other artists, but some of the artists are the ones who have already been mentioned. It seemed fair, if only because of the forthcoming exhibition in the Russian capital, so it seemed fair to draw attention to the reflection of the heritage of the great Dutchman in the works of the Russian artists. And the venue, which is the Jewish Museum, and the theme of the conference and the webinar allows us to focus on artists of the Jewish experience. If we take into account that culture is a mediator between personal and national memory, then we face the problem of a very subtle definition. And include that includes the identification of the presence of Jewishness in Russian art and self-identification of artists with Jewish experience. And oddly enough, the problem of the very definition of what Russian art is. Let me explain. John Bolt, an American expert on the Russian avant-garde, caused some consternation in art history circles when he addressed at a recent conference in Moscow whether it is correct to refer to artists from Ukraine, Belarus, as about Russians. So that used to be the Russian Empire. It should be noted that the Jewish theme in Russian art in art history studies in recent decades is increasing its relevance. And it wasn't possible in the Russian Empire times and it wasn't possible in Soviet time. Undoubtedly, the Jewish Museum's activities regarding Jewish contributions to avant-garde art contributes a lot to this file, so to speak. But not only that, for example, in the year 2021, there was this exhibition called Wandering Stars, Soviet Jewry in Pre-War Art. Even earlier, in 2007, in Kiev, there was a, an exhibition of Kultur League artists. And um, Vera Tchaikovsky's book, The History of Russian Art, The Jewish Note. I mentioned this because what for cultural researchers in Europe, America and Israel has been commonplace for Russia, the consideration of the Jewish experience in such an extended range, it represents, in fact, a new thing, a new field. I will, for the first time, include a special component in this complex problem, and namely, I'll include Rembrandt. Rembrandt occupies a prominent place in the history of Russian culture. We understood that from the first two reports today. And I repeat, Russian, I mean Russian in the broadest sense, of the word. It is quite natural that our prominent scholars were engaged in studies of reverence art and their names were mentioned. And also the participants of the webinar and other scholars since the end of the 19th century, when the foundations of academic canons were shaken, the authority of Rembrandt as an artist for most people is indisputable. And in our Jewish context, However, it would be incorrect not to mention Russian in the narrow sense, artists who were impressed by Rembrandt. Some of them have been mentioned. I'll give you some top names, illustrations here. Those are Nikolai Ge Ilya Repin, who according to Avram Efres was really shocked by Rembrandt. Valentin Serov, Repin, who was his teacher, wrote Serov himself and by his artistic disposition was the one closest to Rembrandt. And in one of his letters, he reports, digging through old folders, I found a whole pile of Serov drawings. Some of those he drew from a painting from Rembrandt's old ladies, etc. We're talking about the Hermitage work, portrait of a woman seated, this one. And another bright star, so sorry, maybe a little slower. I am afraid the interpreters find it hard to interpret in such a... Right, then I'll probably exceed the 30 minutes. And another bright star is Vasily Surikov, 
was impressed by what he saw on his first visit to Berlin. The uh, painting, The Wife of Pentheus Accuses Joseph. And more than 20 years later, he came to Berlin with his son-in-law, and that was none other but the artist Konchalovsky, Pertl Konchalovsky, one of the main heroes of Russian modernism, the founder of the Czech of Diamonds Art Association. So first of all, he took this young man to his favorite painting, quote, I'll show you such a miracle. And he led him to reverence painting the wife of Pentheus accusing Joseph. I will say that I was surprised by this occurrence since both Surikov and Kachalovsky had been to the Hermitage, which contained another version of this painting by Rembrandt, the one which today is in DC in uh, Washington Gallery because it was uh, sold by the Soviet government in 1937 by Andrew Mellon. So Surikov wrote to his teacher Chistikov, they have one thing, I'll never forget it. There's this Rembrandt, a woman in red pink dress at her bedside, her dress, her face, sh sheer delight. The woman's figure glows to the point of blinking. So when in the 80s, after his first visit to Berlin and um, the admiration of his rank, read rosy color, Surikov visited Italy. His biographers write, never before, so this lady on, on, on the left, in pink. Surikov has never before attained such virtuoso lightness and artistic brilliance in technique, such power and tension in color. The future coloristic achievement of uh, the Bayarina uh, Marosova, Nina Viktorovna, a little slower, so that our interpreters would uh, keep up. All right, I'll slow down. I want to think that it was Rembrandt and the unfaithful wife of the Egyptian pharaoh chief of guards who convinced our classical artist that and i quote him there is color and then there is an artist if there is no color then there is no artist and unlike his peers surikov was not only tolerant but extremely sympathetic to the daring experiments of his son-in-law and his friends and he accepted that as early as in 1910th in the context of our topic, first of all, we should consider the artist who Irina mentioned already and some details of the Russian Impressionist Leonid Osipovich Pasternak. Uh, next slide, please. I'm showing the uh, self-portrait and the um, introduction to the uh, book was written by uh, Struk to the Russian ear. Pasternak is an iconic name. It's all about Leonid's son, the poet Boris Pasternak, a Nobel Prize winner who received it for Dr. Zhivaga, and the Soviet government forced him to give up the Nobel Prize. Boris Pasternak was a proponent of the need to assimilate jury into what is called the titular nation in the host country. We actually touched upon this topic in the last webinar. His uh, um, father had a different attitude. The artist's Hebrew name is Avrum Yitzhok Leiba Pasternak. Abraham Leib ben Yosef, or Isaac Yosefovich Pasternak, the variant. Completely unnecessary detail. The grandfather, Kiva Yitzhak Pasternak, was one of the founders of the Jewish burial brotherhood in Odessa, Hebra Kadisha. But here is a detail that, in my opinion, is crucial. When Pasternak was invited to teach at the Moscow School of Painting, Sculpture, and Architecture, that was done with a condition of being baptized an obligatory condition from Pasternak was his refusal to be baptized. And it was in a difficult time, the governor general of Moscow expelled over 20,000 of Jews from Moscow, closed the newly built synagogue, imposed new rules of residence for most categories of Jewish population, leaving thousands without means of livelihood. Let us now take into account the opposite. 
The Jewish Enlightenment came to Europe, the Gaskal era, a topic which touched upon in the last webinar. So that was all over Europe. Pasternak's condition was accepted, and that was in 1894. And before that, the artist opened a private drawing school. He became famous for his portraits, including 36 portraits of Leo Tolstoy and his family. So, sketches of his family, first illustrations for War and Peace and uh, Resurrection, which is another novel by Tolstoy. He became an academician in 1905. In January 1906, at the time of most violent Tsarist reaction regime, he found himself in Berlin. I'd like to remind you that in 1905, that was the time of the first Russian revolution and became friends with Hermann Struck in Berlin. Struck, that's his um, introduction to he, the album, was the student of Joseph Israels, who was mentioned, and that took place in Holland. So he befriended Max Lieberman, one of our heroes as well. Struck became one of the founders of the Mizrahi movement and the author of the series The Jewish World in Postcards, an active Zionist who not only taught Pasternak, the artist, the subtlest of etching, but also drew his attention to the Jewish motives in the works of Rembrandt. Struck emigrated to British Palestine in 1923. By the way, he was one of the initiators of the Tel Aviv uh, Art Museum. And before the departure, uh, Struck and Pasternak made graphic portraits of each other in Berlin. The fact is that already in 1921, Pasternak emigrated from the Soviet Russia, and he kept on working in 1924. He visited Palestine, where he met Struck again. In 1924, it was Pasternak who created the first large pictorial portrait of Einstein, and the graphic one with a violin. He died uh, on May 31st in 1944 in Oxford. And since 1999, there's a museum of him in Oxford. Let's get back to Pasternak. I just explained where this close friendship of the two uh, artists came from. And... Okay, in 1923, as Irina told us, show the next slide, please. Uh, the next one. So, Hermann Struck, and this is the cover of the book, Into Languages. So, Zalsman's publishing house in Berlin published that in Russian and in Jerusalem. Uh, Yavne Publishing House published it in... Hebrew. The uh, uh, introduction was written by the artist's friend, Chaim Natan Balik. Our audience does need to be introduced to someone whose name is given to streets in every city in Israel. He wrote about uh, how none of the uh, Jewish artists of understood the soul and he welcomed uh, the monography in uh, whose art uh, the Jewish uh, theme plays an important role. In his preface, uh, he rebukes the author. He calls him a representative of a generation of um, strangers, outcasts. And the Pasenak justifies himself by saying that it was the Russian society that gave Jewish uh, young people the opportunity to receive an art education, while the Jewish community was completely indifferent even to the masterpieces of Levantan, who was not supported by any Jewish rich man. Towards the end of the preface, uh, Bialik wrote, uh, he said, uh, you are our brother. Come with peace. Uh, God grant that you coming may be a blessing to us as well. The reason I'm quoting this is uh, we need to say that uh, it was uh, Rembrandt uh, who became the trigger for this uh, 
relationship between the two friends. Uh, Pasternak informs the reader that uh, the purpose of his essay is the first attempt to bring the Jewish masses closer to the plastic arts. Uh, as Bialiki talks about the fact that uh, after Holland, Rembrandt is the closest and the most dear to others. He must be to the Jews. Uh, interestingly enough, the high appreciation of Rembrandt as an artist uh, full of true lyricism of the Bible originated in his uh, comparison. Could we please show the next slide? Um, the next slide, please. Um, and his comparison of the characters uh, of um, Jacob uh, blessing uh, the children of uh, Joseph um, and the negative impressions uh, of the nouveau riche Jews uh, that he met uh, in the resort at Kissingen. As masterpieces of Rembrandt's Jewish theme, he recalls uh, David and Saul uh, from The Hague and The Prodigal Son, um, and saying that uh, these uh, three compositions uh, would be enough uh, to talk about uh, his exceptional role in Jewish art. Uh, and he says that uh, there would be no single house uh, where you wouldn't have a reproduction inspired uh, by Reverend Saul, who celebrates the Jews. Uh, Next to Montefiore and Hansel, these words sound prophetic. In the 1960s, Rembrandt albums were customary in Israel as gifts even for weddings. Uh, the American philosopher George Gibbon made a comparison, a, a kind of an essence of Pasternak's observation, who sees uh, that the biblical God in the Rembrandt over the course of time harshly punishes uh, his uh, people for their sins, but becomes merciful, a merciful father for the repentant and those on the righteous path. And I will quote uh, the American philosopher, judging from Leonid Pasternak's interpretation of Rembrandt's work, uh, Jewish values uh, include, and he lists them, humility, uh, etc. The Jewish people are long-suffering and patient. The faces of the Jewish boy in Rembrandt's paintings are inquisitive. From Dr. Zhivago, he says that all of these qualities are also typical for the Russian people. And Rembrandt uh, is always in a space of um, polemical opposition. I'm not sure um, Pasternak contributed uh, colossally to the understanding of James paintings, but he definitely contributed to understanding the Jewish uh, nature. And in the Moscow School of Painting, Sculpture and Architecture, where Pasternak taught uh, um, at the beginning of the 20th century, um, uh, it was um, as famous as Bauhaus and Futimas, an art institute uh, located within these balls in the first decade after the revolution. And there were a lot of Russian revolutionaries, art revolutionaries, uh, who went to the school. It should be noticed that a lot of the avant gardist artists firmly adhered uh, to the thesis that neither Helen nor a Jew and did not solve national problems in art, but draw the universal ones are uh, being constantly in search of universal truths. Uh, Rembrandt's works are also a part of the analysis for and their laboratory research. An example is a diary entry by um, Rivera Stepanova, indicating that Rochenko planned to understand the laws of composition of the judge masters, including Rembrandt, of course, uh, in order to compare them to his own. Uh, Zhekin recalled that his friend, Vasily Chikrigin, next one, please, uh, a brilliant boy who lived only 25 years. Uh, he loved Rembrandt endlessly. Lebedeva writes, the first strong impression, the magic of Rembrandt's Asura Man and Esther in a small museum hall, the Romance of Museum. She went there just to see the small canvas. Uh, near Rembrandt, um, lived in one of the portraits um, was on the was one of the famous uh, Khutimas uh, teachers uh, was uh, Konstantin Istomin. He was noble by birth and not a Jew, but what his students, including Jewish ones, recalled uh, um, in creating a new art, they came to his only living room that was also a studio. He they remembered Rembrandt on the walls. Uh, and Elkanin wrote, so looking at his paintings, you see that room again and every detail of the interior right down to the reproductions of Rembrandt. So next one, the Rembrandt's Night Watch. 
Estomen's uh, painting, The Reading Woman from 1935, depicts not only his uh, favorite model, Lidichka Karitkova, but also that uh, very same night watch. Uh, building on uh, the topic of uh, last week's uh, seminar, the air of uh, Jewish plastics, as uh, our contemporary Russian um, English artist and writer Maxim Cantor, who dedicated uh, his essays uh, to both uh, Chagall, uh, the painter of Paradise, and Rembrandt, uh, the alchemy of Europe, uh, the heir to Jewish plastics, Rembrandt finds himself among his own archetypical images. The next slide, please. So. In his famous uh, flight uh, triptych, uh, in the middle, it's dominated by the vertical a double portrait uh, with a glass of wine, a lively response uh, to a visit uh, to the Dresden Gallery, and the memory of a tall glass in the self-portrait of Saskia. The Hermitage uh, portrait uh, of an old man in red uh, was reflected in the Red Jew from 1915 in the Russian Museum. Meanwhile, it would be utterly naive uh, to attribute the appearance of this work uh, only to Rembrandt without touching the Judaic symbolism of color. And I note that uh, there is no unified interpretation of colors in Judaism. Red is informative here. The text against which the old man is depicted is taken from the Torah fragment with the story of uh, Sire and Jacob. Uh, and Cantor reminds us, uh, Esau asked for red, and he himself is red. He was covered with red hair and the chest on the character of Chagall's painting is covered with red hair and the system of colors adopted by Chagall for his own uh, specific iconography. Red is the color of sin, the color of danger and pain. And I will also turn to historical realities. So, 1915, when this portrait was created, was a particularly disastrous year for the Jewish population in the western part of the Russian Empire subjected to military action. Uh, there was a mass expulsion of Jews uh, as a people capable of betrayal from the frontline settlements. Um, the Jewish question would be resolved not only through deportations, uh, but uh, also through pogroms. Uh, and thus uh, Rembrandt uh, once again finds himself in the thick of contemporary geopolitical events. Uh, thanks to the artistic response of the kindness and not at all revolutionary Chagall. Chagall's etching in Berlin from May 1922 to August 1923 was taught by Hermann Stuck, who turned Pasternak to the Jewish theme and Rembrandt's painting. There's no doubt uh, that uh, they agreed with Chagall on uh, the Jewish accent. Uh, of the Dutchman's uh, graphic art. Uh, by the way, in 1935, on his journey to Palestine, uh, Chagall was accompanied by Bialik, uh, who'd met Pasternak and accompanied him here as well. Chagall needed to get the impressions of the Holy Land in order to fulfill Ambrose Villard's uh, commission for illustration for the Bible. The Chagall Bible was something we talked about at the last webinar, so I'm not going to touch upon this topic, but uh, nonetheless, an important detail. Chagall saw and appreciated Rembrandt, both in the Hermitage collection and in the German ones, but in 1932, he sees his works in Holland, where he comes on the occasion of his personal exhibition in Amsterdam. And uh, he wanted to delve into Rembrandt, and again, he is astounded. Uh, a year before his visit to Holland uh, in 1931, uh, his autobiography, My Life, was published in Paris in the French translation by Ida Chagall, his wife. Uh, the book in which the author began to write in Russia and finished in Paris in 1923, in which Chagall testifies that Rembrandt appears to him in his dreams. And I will quote on the last pages of the book, uh, the Dutchman finds himself in the inner circle. I'd rather think about my loved ones, Rembrandt, my mother, Suzanne, my grandfather, my wife. And I emphasize Rembrandt tops this list. Uh, some of the far last lines, and neither the Tsarist nor servant Russia needs me. I'm not understood. I'm a stranger here, but Rembrandt loves me. With this, he leaves his homeland for a whole 51 years. Uh, he came to the Soviet Union for a brief visit in 1973. Cantor, um, at uh, the end of his essay of Chagall, uh, talks about it, that Rembrandt's um, work was the tuning fork for his art uh, in that uh, 
June has been ridiculed in jokes and then this exaggerated love for little children, tasteless uh, reverence for parents, and suddenly this tasteless sweetness turns into the dramatic prodigal son by Rembrandt and the old Jew and the boy. There's nothing more majestic. This is how majestic through vulgar, melodramatic, exaggerated love Mark Chagall was able to express this and as touching the sandless love proved to be stronger than dictatorship. Um, that's the end of the quote. Uh, I cited one of the last phrases of Chagall's book and the last uh, sentence of uh, Vera Tchaikovsky's book about uh, Alexander Teshler. Next slide, please. Um, a, a painter, a graphic artist, and acknowledged a classic of uh, stage design, as Wikipedia puts it. Uh, uh, this book is called uh, Tashlet the Naughty Age. Uh, it reproduces a virtual meeting between Mark Chagall and Tischler. We go th a path winds uh, through a shady garden and they talk about, about Russia and potentials and appealing Russia about painting, about Jews, about the revolution, about Rembrandt, and of course, about women. In 1921, Chagall began cooperating with uh, the State Jewish Chamber Theatre. We're not uh, going to talk about these works, uh, but uh, they were saved uh, by Chagall in the 1940s when the theatre was closed down and the director Mikhail so was murdered. Tischler was working closely with the theatre. Next slide, please. Uh, and the way he interpreted uh, the images uh, of the performances and recorded the, the plastic nature of the characters, uh, you can easily detect an homage uh, to Rembrandt. Uh, Roman will confirm this uh, because he showed very similar Rembrandt pictures to this one. Incidentally, the idea that Rembrandt uh, was not only a subconscious, but also a conscious reference point for Tischler is confirmed by many episodes of his life. Uh, uh, for instance, his protest against all systems. Uh, why does nobody talk about Rembrandt's system? There is no system. There are brilliant artists, uh, not once or twice in Tischler's works uh, and his uh, graphics and his painting and his theatrical and decorative art uh, characters akin to Rembrandt's world emerge, uh, the carousel, more than once or twice, uh, he talks about uh, Rembrandt's old man as an expression. We can recognize him in the watercolor of the Jewish wedding and other pencil drawings like the prodigal son. Uh, this is a Tashla theory. So 20 years prior to that, uh, prior to these um, works, I showed um, a young portrait of him during a discussion on the occasion of the first discussion exhibition of the associations of active revolutionary art. Uh, this is 1924. Next slide, please. Um, not this one. But, well, you can have a look at this one, too, because it's very important. So, that uh, displayed abstract works of Tischler from the series The Color and Form in Space. Uh, Solomon Nikritin, one of the most radical avant-garde artist, uh, the Futumaster Robespierre, as he was referred to, and to us, he's uh, the serious uh, analyst. Uh, starting from 1925, he headed the analytical cabinet of the Museum of uh, Pictorial Culture. So Salomon Nikitin compared the author to Rembrandt, uh, and the young artist was very much embarrassed by this comparison. Uh, a contemporary researcher tried to understand where the analyst Nikritin could have had such a distant comparison where it came from, and she finds it fair since Tischler's understanding, and I quote, of human nature, the cosmos, the interest for the mystique of existence, uh, and the light that forms from nowhere, the radiance of colors, uh, uh, brings him close to Rembrandt. And very recently, last year, in Tretikov Gallery, there was uh, all his uh, exhibitions were hugely successful. There was this great exhibition of a bright Russian 20th century artist, Falk. And finally, well, a pupil and a teacher, in Moscow School of Paintings, he explained the problems of color on the example of Rembrandt. His student would say, Falk often told us about Rembrandt, but his fourth 
wife says he understood that Rembrandt is even more necessary for him as a guiding star than Cezanne. In his autobiography, which he wrote in 1956 for the French critic Jean Caim, Falk indicated this, I quote, you ask about the artist who had the greatest influence on my work. Of the old masters, Rembrandt has had the greatest influence. In my youth, I neither liked nor understood him, but now he is the pinnacle of art of all time. In fact, the fascination with Rembrandt happened already in the early 1920s. His um, works confirm that. In his art, he references Rembrandt and Cezanne. In the words of Kirill Svetlikov, he says that this is an important task for Falk. I'd like to show the works of three artists, but quickly, please. Next, please. So this is uh, Falk's disciple, and this is Dima Gutov, and there are two more. I'm just showing you the scale. In fact, these are, this is made of metal, and Rembrandt, another look. This exhibition took place in 2015 in Pushkin's museum. Good of our contemporary for who Rembrandt, in his own words, is not just um, a revolution in the history of the world, but in the whole history of mankind. In his works, Rembrandt's uh, graphic goes 3D thanks to this metal. I only briefly reported on responses and memoirs, so memoirs and studies of many biographies reveal not only their influence in the process of formation of the creative individually, but also a lifelong personal adoration of the master. So looking at the biographies of artists who have translated or interpreted Rembrandt's work, it is clear that his images often resonate with personal deep impressions of life. It has been noted that in Tischler's Prodigal Son series, motives of the relation between Tischler and Michels are played. I quote, okay, I won't quote. Is tragic impressions get united with his impressions of Rembrandt, and that is his uh, piece called The Slaughterhouse, which was shown to you earlier. Chagall's Red Old Man is both a tribute to Rembrandt's and the tragic echo of modernity. Sutin's Red Old Man is again a tribute to Rembrandt, but also a daily impression of the painful sounds coming from the slaughterhouses. The slaughterhouses were opposite the romanticized beehive, the Parisian residence of beggar artists, and of course, memories of the pogrom in Belarusia. By the way, there is an episode in Falk's memoirs when in his most prosperous period, Sutin was still maintaining absolute disorder in his six room apartment. He was delighted to see his friend, but when he accompanied his home, they talked wonderfully of Rembrandt Falk in a letter to his third wife, Raisa Edelson from Paris writes, I continue this letter in a remarkable place in the Friedrichs Museum in one of the Rembrandt's rooms. I'm sitting in front of a portrait of Hendrix Stoffels and I see that there are many similarities between you, the two of you, the same warmth, the same soulfulness in the eyes and in your face. So Pasternak is particularly moved by the figure of the boy's mother. What a Jewess, what a mother. I remember my mother, my mother, Jewish holy, holy mothers. And when there was a pogrom in Odessa in 1871, and the crowd of uh, pogromsheks 
was close to our house, my mother, generally thin in appearance woman, opened the window of the lower floor overlooking the street, jumped out and threw herself on her knees before this fierce crowd, begging with tears in her eyes. This totally unexpected sight had such an impact on the crowd that they commanded, guys, let's get out of here. So the mother saved us with her fearlessness and heroism. Examples could be continued. And uh, the Jewish experience of Rembrandt is undoubted. The article in the Soviet art for March 11th, 1936, the opening of the exhibition of Rembrandt at the State Museum of Fine Arts, Alfred Basich has called it our Rembrandt. Of course, a popular critic speaks of the importance of Rembrandt to world culture, but also of the special democracy of his art, which makes this artist an asset to the workers and peasants. Everyone has his own Rembrandt. I don't want to challenge any of these theses, except one. Rembrandt had disciples, but left no followers, with which one might disagree based even on the examples from our webinar. Thank you for attention. Gary, please switch on your microphone. Well, <clears throat> Nina, you've shown us material that we didn't know. None of us had ever seen these artists who are uh, so taken with Rembrandt. Rembrandt could mean so many things, so many different things in such profound ways. Uh, this is uh, was a wonderful introduction to to, to this, this school. When, when this program opened four Mondays ago, I told the audience that Rembrandt seen through Jewish eyes had two curators, myself and Miriam Knotter. She is chief curator and exhibitions manager at the Jewish Historical Museum of Amsterdam. In fact, it was Miriam who first was approached by the Jewish Museum and Tolerance Center to put together a Rembrandt exhibition. She was kind enough to bring me in on the project and I'm very grateful to her. And she's going to join us at, uh, in a few minutes uh, to say, oh, here she is, she can join me now. The webinar was structured mainly by theme with only one subject extending over three sessions, as Nina remarked, Jewish artists. In the keynote address, Simon Shama spoke on British Jewish artists and we have just heard Nina Getishvili on Russian artists. In last week's session, Larry Silver gave us a survey of artists from Eastern Europe to the United States in whose work Rembrandt played a big role. To the artists we have heard about, Rembrandt became joined at the hip, entering into their own artistic and sometimes personal lives. <clears throat> Our other three themes have more distance and abstraction. If I may remind you, the section on Rem Jews and Judaism, Rembrandt's own work, spiritual values that united and divided Rembrandt and the Jews, and Jews in the art world and Rembrandt, and all will soon be available on YouTube. What I have taken away from this intensive experience is partly a confirmation of the idea that brought us here in the first place, that is, that the ways Rembrandt was seen through Jewish eyes had meanings and sentiments of their own that would not have occurred to non-Jews. The old men and old women in his paintings who were seen as Jews opened up possibilities for identifying with them then, and that uh, the artist and identifying with them and identifying with the artist in ways that weren't available to non-Jews. To some degree, the way Jews looked at Rembrandt, even had its influence on the image of the artist to all the world. Having said that, I also realized that anti-Semitic attitudes may have been just as important. 
Much of the behavior of Jewish collectors, artists, and scholars with respect to Rembrandt came about not spontaneously, but in reaction to anti-Semitic slurs or cliches to which they were responding, perhaps even without realizing it. The webinar, therefore, gave me expanded ambition for the exhibition and for our project as a whole. What we have been dealing with is not just a technical issue in the history of art, but existential questions concerning our own ways of looking and our own standing in society. What that means is that each of us as individuals is challenged to test our own thoughts and feelings. We have seen this enacted mainly in the discussions following the talks, and I think all of us are going to continue thinking about what the others have said, which is a great thing. And after Miriam has spoken and Leah has taken leave, we're going to go into one of these roundtable discussions. Well, dear viewers, fellow panelists, I've had my say about the subjects and the speakers, and I now gladly give the microphone to Miriam for her observations and closing statements. Thank you, Gary. <clears throat> As a long-term companion in our quest to understand more about what is fact and what is fiction and what we understand better and what we still do not know about Rembrandt's connection with Jews and vice versa, this project in cooperation for this webinar to which you brought so many important contexts has been pure joy. And thank you all speakers today and speakers of the three last sessions for sharing your thoughts and insights. And above all, thank you, Nika, Leah, Chesney, and colleagues from the <clears throat> Moscow for making this all possible with such devotion. And thank you all, our audience from all over the world for making this webinar such a success by your attendance. May I end with a personal note? I was a very young student in art history and Semitic languages and cultures when I stood in 1992 at the Rijksmuseum in front of Rembrandt's Belshazzar's Feast, fascinated by the prominent inscription in Hebrew letters. Having a close look at Hebrew letters and their shapes, I could see that they were based on a handwritten example. And I imagined how the rabbi wrote this out for Rembrandt after he had a talk about predestination or how Rembrandt even studied Hebrew script with him. And after seeing more Hebrew inscriptions in Rembrandt's work, I decided in 1992 to write my MA thesis on this subject. Like most people at the time, I was convinced that this remarkable inscription, the only example known in, this, in depictions of this scene was the proof and the result of close collaboration, even friendship between the artist and the rabbi. And indeed, that is a lovely idea, cherished by many, as has been so vividly shown by the speakers in this webinar. But during my research, studying the inscriptions in various of Rembrandt's works and works of his contemporaries, my assumptions that they were the result of such a remarkable and special bond for that time started to shake and I had to reconsider my entire MA thesis and statement. Because in Raymond's works, Hebrew letters that look similar miss the details that distinguish them. Raymond makes spellings mis mistakes, something a rabbi, a calligrapher or any Jewish scholar would have pointed out to Rembrandt if they were closely involved or saw the end result. But moreover, there were other candidates in Rembrandt's time to prive him with text and knowledge than Menashe, famous calligraphers who lived around the corner. What does this all tell us? I think on my behalf, but as I also heard during our many panel, great panel talks, there's still much work to do. We should keep reconsidering 
our own previous thoughts and stay open for new theories. And we should cooperate with scholars in many different fields. An important lesson I learned from my old teacher, the belated Ernst van der Wetering, the thriving force behind the Rembrandt Research Project. And secondly, we should dare to sometimes make a statement, throw a new idea into the discussion and never forget about different motives that can lead to a certain extent of cooperation. For example, and I quote, never forget there were judophiles like me, as my great friend and scholar, curator at the Rembrandt House, Bob van der Bogert used to say before we lost him much too soon. It's not only up to us. We should involve an entire new generation who work with new technology, combining big data, Geo-referring maps, 4D reconstructions, of which I see great examples. Combine knowledge. I'm looking forward to the future. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Miriam, and thank you, Gary. Um, for the last four years, I have lived with the idea that... Uh, you <clears throat> Leah, you have to unmute yourself. I did. No, we hear her. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Once again, thank you, Gary. And thank you so much, Miriam, for your words. And for the last four years, I have lived with the idea that 2022 will be a year of Rembrandt in the museum as well as in my life. If I only knew that the start of this year will be so brilliant. This project was launched in a... I see Michael doesn't hear her and Post doesn't hear her. So uh, no, okay. something is wrong. Oh, now I hear a sound. You is hear me? Leah? No. Yeah, Leah, um, well, you need to unmute the original. English or too short. Yeah, English. Um, okay. oh, Leah original is speaking or, English. Uh, yeah, oh. sorry, I, I speak English. <laughs> now you hear okay. me? <laughs> yes, now I can Are we fine? <laughs> yes, sorry. Okay, so I hear you. Who it was the the meant to movie? happen, so I could uh, thank you forever and ever. And oh. ever. <laughs> oh, start <laughs> again. Thank me again. <laughs> yes. <it was> so <laughs> she did the right three times. Once again, thank you so much, Gary and Miriam. And uh, I will repeat my few words that I already uh, said. For the last four years, I have lived with the idea that 2022 will be a year of Rembrandt in the museum as well as my... Is in, in my life, if I only knew that the start of this year would be so brilliant. This project was launched uh, in a bit different world, together with my very good friend and former chief curator of our museum, Maria Nasimova. I remember our first trip to Amsterdam to meet Miriam and Gary for the first time and discuss the future of the project. I'm sure back then we knew it will be our most ambitious project, but could not even imagine how much joy and pleasure we will have working with such great scholars and curators. Preparing an inter in an the international exhibition in the present geopolitical and pandemic times bring incredible challenges. I believe together we are capable to deal with that and bring this project to the successful realization. I thank all the speakers of this series of webinars. This was incredible to see real people behind the names on the book covers. We all, I mean, museum staff and museum curators have in our libraries. I hope all of you will travel to Moscow to see our exhibition one day. All of that would not be possible without great support of museum's general director, Alexander Barada and the help of the State Hermitage Museum, Mikhail Piotrovsky. Thank you once again, and I hope to see you soon in the Jewish Museum and Tolerance Center in Moscow. Uh, thank you, Leah. Yes, October 19th, 2022 to January 15th, 2023. We'll see you all in Moscow in peaceful times, we hope. Now, we have an opportunity to talk to each other. Panelists, you may unmute yourselves. And, uh, and let's talk about some of the issues that have been raised. Oh, Michael, if you can't hear me. Um, no, Larry can't hear me either. I think it's, hmm, 
something to do with your language choice or unmute original talk? I mean, I'm... Yeah, no, Leah, no, you no, hear me. Roman want to, to, to add something, to say something. Yeah, okay, Roman, you're, Great, you're muted you. right now. I'm not, actually. Okay, now you're not. Yeah, that was a question from Steve Nadler. Uh, whether the technical abilities of Sao Metale was good enough to catch the facial features of our hero Menasseh ben Israel. Uh, I will be very short in my view, yes. The point is that uh, the most important uh, detail was the model law, preparatory drawing. Rembrandt was totally exceptional. Uh, and between the printmakers who most probably worked with about no models, about no preparatory drawings, 99% of printmakers in 17th century were working strictly after the modellos, after the preparatory drawings. And uh, we sometimes we can see how terribly they worked with no good modello. Say my, my beloved, uh, my favorite example is um, uh, Rubens uh, woodcutter, Jäger, Christopher Jäger. When we look at his works made after Rubens' uh, beautiful paintings, we see the masterpieces of the 17th century woodcut. When we look at his works done after his own originals, after his own model, uh, one would like just to cry. Mm. So in this way, yeah, that, that's true. If you will put them side by side, you will see the total difference, terrible difference in between works made by himself or made after the modellas provided by guys from the Rubin, uh, from the Rubens workshop. So in uh, this since case... We, yeah. Since we're jumping right into the uh, most debated issue that we've done so far, and that is the identification of the portrait etching of 1636. I have to say, Roman, that you uh, you cheated. I, my argument was not that there were no portraits of learned people in the 17th century without attributes. It was that Rembrandt never uh, did a uh, an etched Still portrait of somebody in the uh, uh, the book world without giving him a book or a magazine. Can't hear Gary either. Well, okay. The problem is, is there... that was, in my view, it was the very beginning. It was the very beginning, and that was the third portrait, if I'm not mistaken, which Rembrandt mm. made like as a portrait, not as Tronia. Yeah? yeah. That was my point that uh, uh, still there was no form tradition, even for himself. For oh, himself, okay, but so Gary, well, he, had, he had done the, uh, the the the. It resembles mostly the uh, the Johannes out of Bolchart, also with the form of the frame that is on the lower side. Gary, you're not coming through to either Michael or me. Well, it's not it's not it's not due to me because other people can hear me. So it must be something in your own uh, settings that that's keeping you from hearing it. Uh, um. Yeah. Okay, how can we solve this? Um, I figured it out. You have to go to the translation button and turn off okay. unmute original. Right. Now, okay. do you see that? So, do you go to the globe? I mean, I hear everyone. Yeah, go to the globe. Yeah. And at the saw, so at you see the list, and it's unmute or mute original audio. Try that. Yeah, Larry, is yeah, that Yeah, Larry, do you manage? So you see English on the right side? I have English and I could hear, so I don't know if okay. that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah, Gary, if, if you put, I mean, sorry, uh, Larry, if you put the uh, mute, the original audio on, you have to change that back, I think. G Gary, is it relevant to your case? that in 1636, 
Manasseh had published only one book of his own, and so perhaps his reputation as a scholar was still fairly um, low key. He was a printer. He was a publisher. He was in okay. business in the book business. Okay. Okay. Let's, so it's it's let's, not that he was a scholar; it's that he was a printer publisher. No. He was sure. quite yeah. well known by that time. Um, uh, this is record, uh, I think. From he, he was as a printer publisher. Yes, yeah. but also as a scholar. I mean, um, we have records from travelers to Amsterdam from the late uh, 1319s that already heard about his reputation abroad and, and, and came to see him. So well, he, I must say that the uh, so he did have a status. And also, this is Laurence's uh, argument, too. She also is on your side. So we're uh, it's we're we're bounced off against each other. It isn't as if there is unanimous rejection of the of, of the identification. But we're not going to solve that uh, right now. There's also, also a blink portrait of the same man. There's also yeah. a blink portrait of the very same man, but he's not identified on the portrait. No. no. Oh no, the that's the whole blink portrait. Right? Mm. You mean? Larry, do you mean the Govert Flink portrait? Yeah. Yes, he does. But but yes. the age of the man and the age is doesn't match there. with the age of, of Menashe. Uh, and, and I assume that inscription is authentic, but yeah, 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 it is. Yeah. yeah. So that cannot be well that 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 made me that's why I kind of went with the idea that we can't, you know, it's very hard to identify the Salome Tali portrait. Uh, because this, basically, this portrait, uh, what Larry just mentioned, it very much looks like the etchings, but it can't be Menashe. Well, you said the Salam Italia portrait. Did you mean the Rembrandt portrait? Yeah. So we basically have three portraits. So there's yeah. two etchings, and there is the portrait uh, later uh, attributed to Flink. And actually, the portrait attributed to Flink is, in my opinion, closer to Rembrandt's etching than the Salom Italia engraving. So, but the portrait can't be Menashe because uh, there is there is an inscription that basically say it's it, and it's um, the age of the man and it differs very much from Menashe. Maria. But I'm still willing to reconsider everything. But there are okay. I have a where for the painted portraits were made after prints, but not vice versa. Uh, yeah. Okay, I have a question for for the Hermitage uh, uh, curators. I, in in doing the research, I found out that the, the one of your predecessors, Vladimir Lawrence and Lessing, was Jewish. He was the son of a very famous uh, Jewish scientist, and you didn't know that. So there was a certain a re reluctance on the part of perhaps of, of Jewish scholars, Jewish art historians and personalities to uh, to identify as Jews in their social uh, existence and in their professional life. Uh, are there, is there something you can say about that? Irina? Irina Alexeyevna, you want to answer? Irina, would you like to answer this? Только надо микрофон включить. Please switch on the microphone. Yeah, it's on now. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Everything is on. You don't hear me. Yes, you're not here. Listen, we hear. We hear. Yeah. Great. It's an interesting question because this year it happened that I received an archive of Vladimir Levinson Lising, Lising as a gift, and he is a major scholar of Rembrandt's art in the Soviet period under his uh, um, heading the uh, famous book Rembrandt in Soviet museums was published. I studied this archive. It's a very interesting topic. The father of Vladimir Francovich really is from a Jewish family. They came from Riga. They came to St. Petersburg from Riga. 
and the father graduated the St. Petersburg University with distinction, but he couldn't stay in St. Petersburg and uh, he moved to Yurev, now it's Tartu in Estonia, because Estonia was being Russianized and uh, the teaching was in German, which was replaced by Russian urgently. And the father of Vladimir Francovich was sent there. And this is where Vladimir Francovich was born. And after that, the family returned to uh, St. Petersburg. The thing is that his mother was uh, from Russian aristocracy, a very famous family. And when the boy was born, well, first of all, the father of Vladimir Francovich uh, adopted uh, Orthodox Christianity. That was the condition of the marriage. And when this boy was born, he was uh, christened in uh, uh, the UDF church uh, under uh, an Orthodox name. He was given an Orthodox name. And his father was called Fyodor. So Vladimir Francovich, uh, he had sort of both sides his Jewish grandfather and his Russian grandfather, they were great St. Petersburg doctors. They worked in two hospitals, both of them in St. Petersburg, for the rich and for the poor. And so this mixture was a mixture of two cultures. And the grandfather and his godfather, that was his grandfather, uh, once removed a famous grandfather. He was a major collector. His last name was Zurov. And so Vladimir Zurov um, took his own life in 1914. And uh, he left his picture gallery to Hermitage. So the most beautiful story is that Vladimir Francovich back in 1930s had to, as a head of uh, uh, Western European art department, he had to give his uh, the, 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 the works of his grandfather for selling abroad. We can imagine what personal tragedy that was. Nobody knew of that. And only today, I'm sorry, no, only this year, I was able to talk about it. But sometimes there are some unexpected things in the lives of people and paintings. I managed to buy back one of the paintings by Zurov. And so uh -huh. now it's back in the Hermitage collection. And this year we had a small exhibition of uh, photographs and documents from the archive and for us it's a major event and another thing so the book by Vladimir Francovic will be exhibited at the exhibition I hope it will be somewhere there and so this is yet another aspect what of this story. dramatic history what a story how, how amazing how and the, it's also indicative of the incredible binding between the Hermitage and so many people over, over the centuries that, uh, that you live with the collection, with the museum, with the, with the, the public, the, the buildings, with the city. And, and, and that, you know, this had such dire personal meaning to the family and that he rose, that Vladimir rose to become such a, a major person in the museum. Thank you. I'm glad I asked this and I'm, I'm glad da -da. that you were able to tell it uh, uh, this, this year. So please, let's see some hands mm -hmm. from other panelists. Shelley. I just have a question for you, Gary, because um, your wonderful lecture on the uh, Jewish collectors, that because the head of the head of Christ um, was given 
by Khan. And I'm, I'm thinking that no, perhaps no, it, it wasn't given by what, Khan. What, was it, was it? It was, it was uh, Khan's sister, Laura, bought it with her husband, Martin Bromberg, and they donated it to the museum. Okay. Thank you for that, because I don't have my notes with me. But um, does, did this mean something about that, that it was a Jew? You know, Absolutely. why? I mean, because a Jew wouldn't, <laughs> his sister was a Jew. I mean, these were Jewish we, people. Why would they w purchase something unless there was some some sen sense that it was a Jew that was depicted there? That's what, oh, I mean, we can't answer that oh, question. You mean that, but the it, model, that the model was a Jew. The model was a Jew, well, yeah. Yes, so yes, I'm wondering so I, if that idea was, you know, continued somehow well, and... I think that the most important thing was that Rembrandt painted a Christ and that they were donating it as Jews. It was really a kind of Judeo-Christian uh, gesture that they were making. And of course, the idea that the model might have been a Jew only added uh, added a dimension. Okay. Thank Hello. you. Yeah. Larry. I had uh, a question for Nina and a question for Irina. Uh, for Nina, I wondered, uh, uh, I'm thinking about Antokolsky, the great sculptor who worked also in Paris, and his presence of, uh, uh, following up almost on Gary's last remark, uh, he made a very famous image of uh, the Jesus being judged, no. which is a little bit like the Gottlieb that I showed. And he also made a, a sculpture, a very moving sculpture, still in St. Petersburg, of Spinoza. So I wonder if you feel that he had a particular interest in Rembrandt's era. And for Irina, I had a question um, which stems from the identifications that uh, existed in earlier inventories and the degree to which uh, the two paintings in the Hermitage, which are still mysterious, um, the the uh, one that you called uh, David uh, and Jonathan, uh, and also the one that has sometimes been called David and Uriah, but which most people think is Haman. Uh, whether you think that we can uh, get closer to a firm identification based on those earlier readings by uh, a number of previous scholars. Uh. So who is to answer first? Nina, you begin and then I'll take over. I wanted to ask for Ashur, Aman and Esther. I'd like to say this. Well, you called that. You, you used another. So the second uh, feast of Esther, right? So there's this detail that one century ago, and I mentioned this young uh, artist, uh, the lady who went to Romantov Museum to uh, admire this uh, painting. Harjif tells the story. It wasn't considered Rembrandt's work at a certain point, and it was in storage, and only Deving von Borda was admitted to it when he visited Moscow. He went to the Rumiantov Museum storage, he made this identification that that's reverent. And then the painting was exhibited in the museum at a sep on a separate easel and young avant-garde artists, they went there to admire this painting. As for Antokolsky, one detail, I read somewhere that Pasternak was the only Jew, academician Jew in Russia. But Mark Matveyevich Antakolsky, that's his Russian name, he was an academician too. And sure, he was very popular. As for the Spinoza portrait, it was done because he was interested first and foremost in the philosophy and he was interested in the 17th century Holland. For him, Spinoza was the embodiment of the 
idea of a Jewish uh, wise man. So yes, for sure, I can confirm that he was interested in in that. Okay, great. And and your question to Rina, Rina, can you answer? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, actually, I can say something about the Haman because I'm just in an article on it for the, uh, it's no secret for the Festriff for Shalom Sabar. I, I wrote an entry on the ha Haman and what I've decided, it's not uh, provable that these must be the three main figures in the story. It's got to be Ahasveros, Haman and Mordechai. And um, and then it doesn't correspond to any particular scene of that play that was on the stage the year before the painting by Ona Servatus. It was a distillation of the three main characters who drew the, drove the story uh, without Esther. Now, why isn't Esther in it? That's a good question. But um, uh, that's my take on it right now. I'm, I'm willing to give my opinion for another. I sent uh, Irina that manuscript so she knows all of my deeper feelings. What do you think, Irina? Well, I'd like to start. I, I'll, I'll answer Nina. So her question regarding the Romance of Museum so this painting is from the Hermitage Museum. It was uh, it it uh, came to Russia in a rather difficult condition, difficult state. Let's put it like that. So it has always been attributed to a reverend, but as you know now, there is this wide uh, discussion whether it is Rembrandt, whether it's not Rembrandt. But then we interpret it back to Rembrandt. That is a part of the biography of every painting. So this painting has always been very successful, very popular. It is. It, it, it also suffered greatly. That's the only thing I know. It, it's the only painting which was transmitted from one basement to the other, which is a unique case. It was in a bad condition, and that's why it was... At the, on the so-called special regime that we have, it was sent to Germany, it was restored in Germany by the uh, by Alois Hauser, famous specialist in that, and then when it was returned, there are changes to its condition, and we do not let it out of the museum because it's really fragile and reacts to uh, changes. Um, in environment, as for attributions, so many interesting and attractive opinions and speculations. But after a little while, we have to say no to some kind of a new interpretation. The conditions of life of reverence paintings, there are so many profound humanity that it really gives us an opportunity to look at them differently. And so it's not a coincidence that, well, there was this very interesting story, the fall of Haman, and it, it, it appeared as to us, it came to us as a fall of Haman, and we thought that was the, and, and, then, and then for several decades, this was considered as Uria, another character, and we have a lot of examples like that. And uh, David and Jonathan, that was, it's it spelled out in the documents of the 17th century as the story of uh, David and Jonathan. And so this uh, identification changed after that. That is also true. I think we should uh, just uh, come about it uh, as we should be really paced uh, discussing whether it's um, just Rembrandt alone or him with an assistant. Uh, all this indicates is that uh, Rembrandt is constantly on our minds. Uh, um, we're constantly coming back uh, to analyzing and uh, researching these works and it, it's an eternal journey. If uh, we ever come closer to the truth, uh, it's a huge joy. These uh, works exist uh, 
the works of art uh, mm. have uh, uh, first a lot of the works were rejected some of them came back uh, some of them uh, didn't uh, and despite uh, this uh, array of arguments uh, sometimes very odd ones uh, it's also a part of our life uh, mm. And yeah, I it think certainly is certainly certainly for Rembrandt the people, I, for art historians in general, for people in any culture, but for uh, Rembrandt people, it's this uh, constant, uh, this tumbling that we're doing. And Roman do, did a beautiful job in pointing out all of these motifs that could have different meanings and didn't point to any particular thing, but yet look like semaphores. They look like uh, details that are bearing the meaning. And then he leaves you uh, without real clues to, to definitive choices. So I, I suspect Rembrandt sometimes of just being deliberately ambiguous and, uh, and leaving it up to you to project your own feelings and somehow knowing that your emotions are going to complete his work and is going to make it that much more uh, precious to you. And, uh, and certainly the, with our subject about the Jewishness, it certainly has worked that way for a lot of people in different countries and places. Miriam, <clears throat> you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, um, I just wanted to bring in uh, something Tirtje Levy Bernfeld, who is, uh, I don't know if you know her work. She's a Dutch scholar uh, specialized, especially in Sephardi women in, in, in Rembrandt's time, 17th, 18th century. Mm. Um, interestingly, she uh, recently published again. Um, uh, about the fact that uh, Sephardi women, more than any, any other women, basically were not allowed to go to leave the house. Uh, basically, on, the only time like like they could really go out was when they were going to the synagogue, and uh, then they would dress up lavishly, and 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 and, and uh, we have some images of of that. Um, so. One thing I wanted to point at, because it has been previously suggested that Rembrandt saw Jewish brides, etc. It's, it's quite unlikely that he would have met a Sephardi woman with loose hair, like, you know, the great Jewish mm -hmm. bride. Uh, no way any Sephardi woman at that time would be seen on the street like that. They were very protected. They were... Uh, kept in the house until they were married, and then they were basically handed over to the next, <laughs> you know, from the brother or the father uh, to the husband. And they were re relying on servants th that would be allowed to go out. So to go to the synagogue was their moment, but then they would really dress up. And and so I think we, we have to keep the reality in mind of, of, of what was visible on, on, for Rembrandt at his time. That's a great time. point. That really is a very important argument, and, and I, I, I agree, okay. certainly. But what fascinates me about the genders of the uh, portraits is that in the etchings, it's always women who are called Jews, and in the paintings, it's always, it's always men. Very uh, interesting. Gary, you have a point there. Mm-hmm. So I, I've been bringing this up. Why oh, a second? Roman doesn't agree. Tell me, what is what are the exceptions? Uh, we have certain number of exceptions, like the portrait uh, today called portrait of uh, the man in a tall hat, which the model which was most probably a father. Uh, it was called in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in late 17th century, it was called the portrait of uh, Philon of Alexandria, mm. the Jewish philosopher. Yeah? Although it's uh, uh, until Middleton, until 1878, it was believed to be Philon of Alexandria, although we have, yeah. uh, we have no oh, okay. visual no, okay. Yeah, but I'll, I'll, no, I'll grant that in Gersan and the early identifications, even through Barch, that some of the portrait etchings, uh, some non-portrait, the Turmes were called were called Jewish men too. But in the from the the later uh, catalogs, don't have any 
uh, heads like that anymore. But the, in the paintings, they really are only only men. Uh, even the ones that look like they might be pendants in the uh, in the Pushkin Museum and the Hermitage, it's always the men who are called Jewish, and and the uh, the women aren't. But there's the exception of the Jewish bride. Uh, okay. <laughs> Two Jewish <laughs> brides. It is it always exception. Paintings, yeah. yeah. Mm. It's a pretty no, good no, exception. No general rules on that. With more Jewish <laughs> brides. <huh? laughs> if you don't mind, I'd like to say something to uh, Roman. Um, about the, the combination of things from your own. Oh, I don't, I'm not muted. Can you hear me? Yes, sure. we can hear you. Oh, okay. Is it okay if I talk? Okay. I just wanted to say something about this mixture of things from the present and the things from the past. That's something that, that Rembrandt does quite a, a bit of, and in fact, is throughout the history of art. So if he has a vessel that's modern in an in a Old Testament scene, I mean, that goes way back in the Middle Ages when they use things from their contemporary life. Uh, it, within the context of the biblical. But for Rembrandt, I think it's, it's a very astute comment because um, for Rembrandt, the, especially because of the Jews, the, the contemporary Jews make their way into the biblical scenes. And for Rembrandt, it's always bringing the Bible down to earth. It really does. He, he brings, he takes from contemporary life and he puts it into the biblical scenes. And the biblical scenes have contemporary life. And I think that more than any other artist, perhaps, I mean, it's done before, the Rem, it's part of Rembrandt's method, his procedure. Shelley, I think we're going to take this as a closing, as a beautiful closing statement. Oh, I'm sorry. For our roundtable <laughs> discussion. <laughs> Um, so, uh, unless anybody has a, a more interesting question than that, a remark, uh, I think we'll let the audience go and uh, really uh, close something. And my thanks to all 11 others of you, as well as the museum, the wonderful Marina and Kate and, uh, and Andre and the other translator and Leah. Uh, this is a beautiful experience for me and I hope for you too. So. And you, Gary, thank Огромное you. Спасибо. And Miriam. <laughs> thank you so much. Good night. Thank you.